kernel debugging with WinDebug. So, uh, what we've done up till now has been user mode code. Things like a browser and the command line and such. This is code that runs at lower privileges, what's called ring 3 in the kernel. This code does not have the ability to directly contact hardware. If you want to use the hardware, like print something on the screen, then you cannot directly send a message to the screen. What you have to do is go through a chain of command. Typically, your user application adds the kernel32.dil library, and that sends it to the ntdil, uh, the so-called native API, which is not intended for normal developers to use, but only for internal Microsoft developers to use. And that then calls ntos kernel, which is the kernel, the part of the operating system that runs with full privileges to touch the hardware. And the kernel, plus the device drivers, all run in kernel mode where they have complete control of your computer. And that's where you, you pass the request to them and they contact the hardware on your behalf. And this is why Microsoft likes to keep other people's code out of the kernel. And the problem is, in the past, um, all device drivers, even now all device drivers have to be in the kernel, and Microsoft has been getting pickier and pickier about the quality of device drivers because when a device driver fails, it causes a blue screen of death. Because if you have a crash in the kernel, the whole machine is dead, and there's no way, nothing it can do. If you have a crash in user land, it can pop up an error message and keep going because it doesn't crash the fundamental heart of the computer, it just stops one process out here, and the remaining parts of the operating system that still work can pop up an error message and let you restart it or something. So, let's take a look at, if you want to examine the kernel, you can't use a user land debugger like Ollie. You've got to use Microsoft's product, WinDebug, which is pretty hard to use. It was originally, uh, in my opinion, a command line tool, although it always had a very primitive GUI, and Microsoft has slightly improved the GUI, although not that much. So, uh, I, I had a Microsoft engineer in one of my classes, and he told me they had improved it with this new thing called WinDebug Preview. And it's better, but it's still a lot harder to use than Ollie. So, the NTOS kernel itself is a single executable file, and you can see it. It's in C Windows System 32. And it's named NTOS kernel. K R N L dot exe. There it is. And so you can examine it with various tools, for example, CFF Explorer. We'll show you that it's a 64 bit executable. And here's the files it exports. Um, not having any luck, or maybe this will work. There we are. And so you see it has some exported functions that don't even have names. And then it's got things like ALPC create security context. And if I go down a page at a time, you'll see there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of, ex of functions exported by the kernel that do little tiny um, esoteric things. And this is what's really going on whenever you run code, is it's calling all these little kernel routines to do all the work. So, let's use WinDebug Preview. Now, if you want to debug the kernel, you have to change the boot up settings of your machine in a command prompt, an administrator command prompt, and you have to execute a couple commands here, bcd edit to change the boot configuration data. bcd edit slash debug on. It's not something you normally have on because it means your machine can be stopped by requests to break into the kernel but it is what you have to do if you want to debug the kernel. So now it's dbg settings local. Means I'm going to debug the kernel from this local machine, not from another machine controlling it remotely, which is really the old-fashioned standard way to do it. But it's a lot easier for us to just use one machine. 
So after you've made those changes, you have to restart your machine. And now we want to run WinDebug Preview. As administrator. Alright. And now we hit File and attach to kernel. And we want to do the local kernel. Here's some options to connect over a network to a remote machine, but we're just going to do local kernel debugging. We look at the kernel of the one machine we're using. So here it goes. Windows 10, 64-bit. Here's a bunch of threads running. All right. And so the first thing I'm going to do is load modules with LM just to see what modules are loaded. And you see NT is the kernel itself. It's NTOS kernel, but it's the only one that's abbreviated here as NT. And it has the symbols. This PDB file is the symbols that let you refer to named locations in the kernel and named variables and such and, and, and uh, named functions. But the symbols are very handy. And here's some other things that are loaded, but we don't have the symbols for them. Things like hardware policy. Now, this is the sense in which they've tried to make it a GUI. If you click NT, it will type in the command to give you information about NT for you, which is LMDVMNT, which shows you um, a little more information about NT, like its image path and so on. Uh, nothing enormously important. But you do get functions within NT that are here. And here's that list of all the functions in the kernel, which is the same thing we looked at earlier in CFF Explorer. And uh, this is where I sort of fault Microsoft for their usability. It gives me all the ones starting with A, which is about 20 screens full of stuff. And then I can click B, C, and D, but again, I'll just get 20 screens full of stuff. So. I don't know what the point was of having things for me to click when it's going to be so unusable. They might as well have just admitted that it was a command line tool. And all you do when you click links is it types the command. And here's the command to see all the things in NT starting with A. NT bang A. And X is the examine command. And these switches somehow specify to give me the names of functions. So if you want to understand how to use these commands, you use the help. And the uh, now they made that easy to find right here, local help. That's nice. You used to have to use .hh or something to get to this. But the local help is still a Windows 3.1 chum file. <laughs> An incredibly primitive system, but this is the way to learn Windows Debugger. And so if you use the X to learn about examine, for example, double click this. And you'll see information about those switches for the X command, which the uh, GUI used to show me the names of functions. So slash F was one of the switches. And I assume that means, yep, display the data size of a function. OK. Anyway, um, this is where you totally learn how to use the command line commands. And the command line commands are totally the way to really control the debugger. Anyway, we'll do a few things here. You can do UF to unassemble a function. And then you can give it the name of your function, like ntbang 
ntcreatefile. That's one we used before with Windows API Monitor. When monitoring Notepad, we monitored this API call, and we can look at the code for it with uf. And you will see some assembly language code here, and not very much of it. That's it. It almost all fits on the screen. And if you read this stuff, it's doing almost nothing. It's just doing a bunch of moves. It's taking the input data for ntcreatefile and just loading it into a memory data structure and then calling iopcreatefile. And this is what most of these functions do. They're just shells for lower level functions. They rearrange the data and pass it into a lower level function, which actually does the work. But that's the assembly for ntcreatefile. Now you can search for patterns of data here, like this one. I can search ntbang ntcreatefile, uh, looking for length of 100 bytes for the search. I can search for this pattern of bytes, 44, 24, 40, and see where that is. And it found it here, 44, 24, 40. So there's the address. All right, and I can find strings with search minus SA, which searches for printable strings, and look, starting at the location NT create file, and looking for 100 bytes from there. And so it found various printable strings here, <coughs> all of which look to me like they're just random strings. This one here is a little bit long. You can restrict the length of the string by adding a minus. Right here, you can put a square bracket L6. And that will search for strings of length 6. And the only one of that is this SVWA thing. So, and this is all what you find in that uh, chum help file, is exactly how to lay out these switches to restrict things. You can also dump the contents of memory. If you do db nt itself, that will show you the first few uh, bytes of the nt kernel itself. And, in, and b means display it in both hex and ascii. And you see this is the way it always is. Every Windows executable always starts with mz, and it always has this legacy ms-dos header that has this message, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. So the kernel of Windows is just another exe file, just like all the rest. All right, and we can examine a data structure. We can do dt to see the structure of underscore file underscore object. So this is the uh, data structure used to refer to files. And if you go back, you will see the layout. It's a two-byte integer here for something called type, then size, then final status. Here's the permissions, read access, write access, delete access, and so on. Uh, you can see the structure. You can see the running tasks with .tlist. It shows you all the currently running processes. And one of them, here's the Windows Store. And some, here's something called your phone, which must have something to do with Microsoft's new attempt to indicate to uh, incorporate Android. Here's explorer.exe. That's the process that draws the desktop, and so on. All the currently running processes are there. And you can dump uh, more details about a process with bang process 0, 0, and then a name of it, like lsass. Uh, DXE, the local security authority subsystem. And that will tell us a little more information about it, like the uh, memory location it's at and the, where the process environment block is, which is uh, a piece, a data structure that helps to control the loading of the mod parts of a process into memory. You can see devices and drivers with bang dev node, 0, 1 disk, for example, will show me um, hard disks, connectors. It's showing me the um, connect 
information about my physical hard drives. And so one of them is a physical device. Here's the physical device objects. Zero one disk, for example. You can click the PDO address for more information about this physical device. And that will show you uh, some more rather esoteric data, including the instance path, which uh, I am. There it is, there's the instant path. And this says it's Red Hat Virtual I.O. So that would suggest that in some sense we're using some kind of Red Hat virtualization here. Now, when I do it on my local VMware, it says VMware. This makes me think that whatever this stuff uh, Caitlin is using, Proxmox, is ultimately based on Red Hat Linux. Anyway, um, all right. So, and so actually, what's going on is that it's using the Vert I/O drivers yeah. for the disks that come from Red Hat. So the um, the distribution itself is based off Debian. Okay, but it's using drivers from Red Hat. All right. Anyway, but so so that's those are a few kernel structures, and you see this is why uh, there are no real secrets in Windows. Microsoft has undocumented. Uh, methods and undocumented uh, libraries, but you can just figure out in WinDebug what they're doing if you get good at it. And that's uh, what kernel debugging looks like.